you guys come next. But first, our next speaker is Arnie. He is CTO of Valohai, and they provide a machine learning platform. And he doesn't like notebooks too much. He'll tell us about that. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let me just get started. So actually, whatever. Yeah. So uh, my presentation is called Say No to so Notebooks. And um, the point is, well, you probably shouldn't be using notebooks after you've done a little bit of maybe experimentation with them and so on. But when you go to production, they're not the right tool. That's what I'm talking about. So first, the obvious slide about myself. Um, yeah, Arni, AKX on the internet, CTO, co-founder at Valohai from Finland. I write Python mostly. Uh, I don't like R, so you might want to have a fight with me, with me about that later. Um, I like beer. I like open source. I'm not a data scientist. I'm a coder. So, yeah. And one more thing, or one first thing, actually. Uh, feel free to interrupt and complain if I'm saying something silly. So, and probably afterwards when we have the uh, throwable mic, you'll probably complain even more. Right, so uh, notebooks. Who here uses Jupyter notebooks, R notebooks? Okay, yeah, great. Uh, R Studio, yeah, so all in all, basically everyone. Who doesn't use notebooks? Good, 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 you're good people. Um, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, notebooks are basically an interactive environment where you run code. It could be Python, mostly it's Python, it could be R. There are kernels for other languages, and um, it's actually a good tool when you are doing like interactive grinding. If you do MMOs, you know grinding um, of your algorithms or when you are exploring data trying to get a grasp of what's actually in your uh, data set and uh, it's nice because you get fast feedback like immediate feedback for of uh, charts graphs uh, statistical numbers so on about your code uh, about your model and data uh, but I mean I said this was I don't like notebooks so this is the only slide that's going to end with the good in a title, so it's all bad from now on. So, uh, <coughs> yeah. First, one of the problems with um, notebooks is that they are nonlinear. And, yeah, I've shamelessly so stolen this image from uh, Joel Gruse, who actually had a talk about the same thing at JupyterCon a couple of weeks ago. So, one, one problem with uh, notebooks is that you can go back to earlier cells and edit the code. So basically, you end up with a state that might be actually completely um, non-reproducible. So you can like, let's say you have a variable x, and you change it, and then you have another cell that, well, actually this is from another slide. Anyway, <laughs> I did rehearse this, but I forgot everything, everything I rehearsed. But either way, you get notebooks that are actually impossible to re-execute in, in worst cases, which you can't really do with linear code, which is what I'm advocating for. So you can also see that variables go stale, and you might actually end up using, a, through a typo or something, a variable that you had actually initialized in an earlier version of a cell, which you've since then overwritten, and you don't, don't have the history of each cell available necessarily. So basically you have a program that's in a state that you can't really even comprehend. So that's not exactly optimal, let's say. Uh, yeah. Secondly, there's the uh, developer experience. And because, as I said, I'm a coder, that's a thing that I really you know, root for. So I'm, I can wager that uh, VS Code, PyCharm, Sublime Text, Vim, Emacs, whatever, has a better developer experience for Python than uh, Jupyter has. We can fight about that as well. So uh, if you use, uh, by the way, who uses PyCharm in here, maybe? Great, OK. Who uses VS Code, Sublime Text, something? OK, yeah. So uh, you know you have all of these linters. You have, um, you can see unused variables and so on in the code. And this is not something that you get with um, uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And also, this is also from uh, Joel Gruss. Uh, the code completion in Jupyter is not exactly perfect. I mean, you might want to use a file name for your variable, but most people don't. So yeah, 
I, I mean, my stats in PyCharm, it actually keeps stats for every time you use some of the uh, code intelligence and completion functions. So it's like, it says I've saved like a thousand typos and 500 bugs and so on just because I've used PyCharm. So, you know, you might want to take that into consideration. And yeah, next thing is horsepower. So uh, you usually run your notebooks on your laptops. That's at least the trend. Uh, you can, of course, run them on uh, the servers or other machines. But when you do run them on servers, you usually tend to incur the wrath of a CFO who is like, why the hell is this machine that has a big ass GPU being unused 99% of the time because you are at a co on a coffee break or something and the notebook is still there running and you're not just using it. So the resource use optimization is one thing and another thing is uh, that with a MacBook like this old 2013 workhorse, you know, you can't really run big data, big data sets, uh, deep convolutional networks on, on this GPU. So you probably need a larger GPU or TPU or so whatever in the end anyway. And notebooks are not really good for non-interactive computation. You can run them non-interactively using NB convert, but that's beside the point. It's not designed for that. And besides, if you have a notebook that you've successfully run and um, might have run non-linearly, then you're not going to be able to uh, run it linearly successfully anyway, so you have that. And um, yeah, and then there's the um, dependencies. Uh, who here likes the uh, current story about packaging in Python? Okay, that's a good answer, like maybe a couple of people. Yeah, so the problem is uh, Python's packaging still isn't really good. It's getting better because of pip and so on, but most of the time it seems that like data scientists and notebook people don't care that much. They just, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're, you're all good people and you don't just copy paste stuff off the internet, but there's like pip install TensorFlow into your global environment and then you have who knows what version of TensorFlow. You know, move 10 months forward, TensorFlow has, you know, released 20 new versions and you take your old notebook, try and run it, and you notice that, yep, nope, it's not working because, you know, old, old version of TensorFlow had something, so on, you know. So, uh, Keeping track of, uh, track of dependencies is also important. I mean, it's important with every project, but it's also important here. Um, yeah, the actual Pandas um, example on there on the slide is actually from a Stack Overflow question that I answered. They had a problem with a pickled Pandas file. They, they got from a coworker who had been using a newer version of Pandas. And because, you know, Pandas 0 0.19 doesn't have that particular class, the unpickling failed and he was in a pickle, pun intended. Um, yeah, so next, there's, yeah. What I actually touched on earlier is data dependencies. So you have these intervariable dependencies and um, you also have the uh, data file dependencies. So let's say you have uh, files on the disk or in, in SQL or wherever and you have uh, file names and connection strings or whatever hard-coded in your notebook, that's gonna be a problem for anyone else trying to use a notebook because you know they are not going to have that file or they are on a different segment of your corporate network and can't access the uh, SQL database. Or worse yet, you've just copied some data into your repository uh, from that source and they can't access it and you know, it's undocumented, it's a, it's a blob of some data, and you kn who knows where it came from, which is also a problem. But yeah, that's actually strictly not a notebook thing. Um, I work with people who are doing this hard-coded past stuff in regular code, but it's also something that comes up with notebooks pretty often. Yeah. So, un unpopular opinion, you shouldn't use notebooks that much. So, for as I mentioned, for initial data um, exploration, notebooks can be the right choice. So you can, you know, fiddle around with your data. But I mean, you're probably not gonna be a bad enough dude. Who got this reference, by the way? Anyone played the NES game? No, good. Um, <laughs> you are probably a bad enough dude to write good code that ha doesn't have errors, typos, that your IDE could save you from. So basically, let's say you are 
you have two variables x x zero and x one, and they are important, and you are actually only using x zero twice, and then you don't notice until like half an hour later when you're debugging your code that oh yeah shit I should have used x o and x one. So that's something that an IDE saves you from. You get the uh, squiggly lines that say, and you're not doing things right. So then there's the state. When you have a, a nonlinear execution, you also have to have the state of your notebook in your head if you are running it. So let's say, you know, someone posts a badass meme on Slack. You go there, you know, take half an hour laughing at the uh, meme. It was that badass. Then you go back to your notebook and you realize that you know you have no idea what the state of the notebook is actually when you're running it. And you might be might not be able to rerun it because, you know, non-linear code. Um, and yeah, then there's the uh, big data stuff. So if you are using a MacBook and um, have enough data, you have to spend time doing streaming of the data, working with smaller segments of the data set, which is also suboptimal. So yeah, in my not so humble opinion, you should just use plain old Python modules, packages, and scripts. It's actually not that hard. So now I hear, no, well, I don't hear, but I could hear you saying something about the state stuff. So yeah, having persistent state is actually useful uh, for exploration, but also not having implicit hidden state is much nicer in my opinion. And yeah, there's the problem of have not having your data sets in memory if you are not using uh, notebooks or uh, state in memory. So loading times might be an issue. Uh, it actually turns out that there's a, pro uh, there's a solution for that which will occur on the next slide. So, but yeah, not having state is in my opinion a good thing. So it also forces you to think about code factoring basically packaging, uh, modularizing your code earlier on than just having a notebook that has a linear or a nonlinear uh, progression of, of uh, cells. So basically you, you have your ETL or extract transform load steps probably in a separate function or a separate module and not interspersed with other stuff like your model building and so on. Also, this is actually really undocumented in NumPy but you can use uh, the mmap mode. Who of you know about the mmap mode in NumPy? Zero, yes. As I said, undocumented. So, but you guys are using NumPy for something, I imagine? Yeah, okay, yes. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, you can use mmap mode, which basically means uh, it maps a NumPy file on your disk or network share or wherever into memory. So it basically uh, accesses the file transparently in memory from the disk. So you can do all of the basic stuff you can do with NumPy, but it actually reads it from the disk as you need it, and uses the uh, file syst uh, operating system's file system cache to keep only the uh, pages in memory that you need. And there's also a se separate daemon that you can use to lock those pages in memory if you really need them to be in memory all the time, but that's beside the point. And if things are still slow, you know, go to that CEFO who is rumbling about you anyway, and ask, ask for new hardware. I mean, if you're still running on spinning Rust HEDs that, uh, on a SATA disk or something, you really shouldn't. There's, I mean, it's 2018, there's no reason to be running on old hardware anyway. Yeah, and this factoring stuff, oh yeah, there's a quote about, uh, about this stuff from Francois, Francois I, don't, I don't speak French, despite the first slide. So this is the uh, guy who wrote Keras. Who knows Keras? Okay, yeah. So yeah, he should know about his stuff, and, and he has a quote about it, so I'm gonna trust him. So yeah, about this factoring thing, uh, notebooks aren't really testable at all, in my opinion, but you know, Python code is. Uh, PyTest, for example, is an excellent framework for writing tests for Python. So when you are forced to slip, uh, split your code, firstly you end up writing a library, basically, so you get a nice library of code that you can reuse for later on and, and in different projects and so on. And you know the ins and outs of that code. You know how to use it. And se secondly, you can test it. So if you have um, some data loading code or transformation code that happens to be common, 
uh, you can spend less time debugging it when you have written tests that prove that at least this part of your code was correct, even if something else goes wrong. So you can kind of exclude that bit of code that's provably tested from debugging. So yeah, that's also a thing. Um, and yeah, the uh, screenshot over there is from PyTest, which is, as I mentioned, a great testing framework. It takes really zero effort to get going with. You just write a function that starts with test something, and you test stuff in it, and use asserts, and you get this, which is nice. So um, there's also, in my opinion, a kind of a best of both worlds solution. So it's PyCharm. And no, I'm actually not being paid by JetBrains. You've mentioned PyCharm three times in this talk. Even though if there are any JetBrains people in the audience, it seems my uh, license is, you know, up to be renewed. So if you guys, anyway, yeah. So PyCharm has scientific mode, which basically uh, turns your um, turns your screen into this kind of pseudo notebook thing. So you have a pane with uh, your charts and graphs from Matplotlib or whatever, and you have your code and you have your debugger, which is nice. So you can pause wherever and see what what the uh, values of values are, like you can with debuggers, and you also have a linear console where you can't rewrite code, but you can run code several, uh, multiple times, so you get like none of the non-linearity, but all of the interactivity, so best of both worlds. And if you don't like, like to use PyCharm for whichever reason, you probably can do the same stuff with VS Code and IPython, but I don't know how. So, yeah. Um, looks like that was the gist of it, so there's the uh, obvious sponsor slide, so yeah, or it's not sponsor slide, thanks to Zalando for letting me be here and talk about this stuff, uh, but yeah, I'm here because of Valohai, which is the uh, startup I'm the CDO of, and we are basically a deep learning pipeline management platform. Um, we take care of all of the other stuff, such as starting up uh, servers, getting your data in, getting your output models out, and so on, taking care of logging, bookkeeping, collaboration, all of that stuff, so you can just con uh, con concentrate on what's important, i.e. the data science, but we don't really support notebooks. Well, actually, we could. We actually support running anything that runs on Linux, but, you know, we don't advocate notebooks. But, yeah. Yeah, that's all, folks. Um, yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Disagreements? Yes. Kiitos, kiitos for the talk. <laughs> but uh, my question is, uh, are there any viable alternatives for pedagogical purposes, such as teaching at the university? Uh, so, uh, al alternatives to, like, for notebooks in, um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's that's actually a good question. Um, the other guy, the jo uh, Joel Gruss, who wrote uh, had a presentation about the same stuff. He actually has written a book about data science in Python, which has good examples that are not notebook based. So, you know, basically just in book form, interspersing code with uh, with prose, the old school way, and you have the uh, scripts and everything on, on GitHub or probably with the book. So, yeah, that works. And I mean, you can, of course, uh, use notebooks for, like, uh, well, for, for mixing code and prose, and just as long as you just run everything linearly and tell your students or whatever to not, you know, screw around with that so that they don't make beginner mistakes. Hope that answers your question somehow. <laughs> Okay, um, my question is, okay. Uh, so first of all, what about uh, Zeppelin and other kind of technologies that you can run in cluster? And the second is, what about the features that you can have with GitHub that you can integrate with um, Jupyter, for example, and you, cannot, you cannot have this with a normal Python code? Mm, what sort of integration do you have with GitHub, with Jupyter and GitHub that's not possible with Python code? I'm intrigued, actually. Because like, yeah, you you can have uh, a markdown file in the same repository as, as your Python script, so like, you know, with regular code. And you can, of course, have I, 
no, IPI notebooks in your repository for illustrative purposes or documentation purposes. So I mean, you can get the best of the both worlds, but for execution and um, going to production, I don't think notebooks are the right choice. And uh, the uh, first question was about Zeppelin and, yeah. and cluster stuff. Uh, honestly, I don't have a good answer for that right now, but you know, uh, at Valohai we uh, support um, Horovod, the uh, distributed learning, uh, distributed framework from Uber for doing distributed stuff, which works with regular Python code. So those are options as, as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. Also, yeah, there's yeah. one more slide, which is contact info and a picture of a very round seal. Yeah, my question to everyone, who is here using uh, Google Co Colab? No one? Okay. So I think it will be in future uh, the solution instead of uh, Jupyter Notebook. So no one use it. Uh, Google Colab. It's something from Google instead of uh, Jupyter uh, Notebook. Thank you. Okay, I'll take a look at that. Thank you. Thank you. We've got one more question here. Really big qualifier. Sorry, I think you had a really big qualifier, which was just don't do it in production. Yeah. And my big question is, what does production mean to you? Because I could see it meaning two distinct things. One is you consider production to be where you run your automated pipelines of data, as in like reports. They run on a minutely, hourly, daily basis. Mm -hmm. That could be one version of production that a data scientist or a data engineer might think, oh, that's you know our reporting yeah, production. So someone else. The other might be you have a platform that allows a lot of data scientists who are your users and customers to interactively ad hoc explore the data to do some analysis and understand how to create their production mm -hmm. process and reports. Does that, do you consider that to be production as well or is that not what you're saying for production? Uh, with production, I mean when you have models or something that you need to be able to chain repeatedly and um, reproducibly. Uh, for data exploration, as I, as I mentioned, notebooks are still a fine, fine tool as long as you, you know, know what you're doing and don't end up with notebooks that you can't reproduce. So, uh, and, and notebooks that you can't turn into code for the inevitable time when you actually have something that works for your data that you've explored. Which is, I mean, it's an easy pitfall and the, and the easy foot gun with notebooks to uh, end up with notebooks that you can't really reproduce without backtracking a lot. So that was basically the gist of it. So then I, I think, to some extent, my other question would be, who is your, who are, who's your advice for? If it's for the engineers who aren't necessarily doing the ad hoc analysis of the data, they're just kind of doing the programming and might actually be inheriting the notebooks from the people who are doing the ad hoc exploration and aren't really good programmers and don't know good engineering practices, then notebooks might be appropriate for the other audience. They're just not yeah. right for the engineering audience. Yeah. And I have a little bit of a, a rebuttal to that. Yep. Yes, you're right. I would hate to use them, except that they're what my customers and my users use. So I kind of have to know what they're living in. Mm. And I, I, I hate it. I love to hate what they're doing. And I would complain to them, you shouldn't use this. But at the same time, I realize it's just easier for them. So I have to be familiar with what they're doing. Yes. So that's kind of my rebuttal. And yeah. We can fight. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, <coughs> thank you. Um, yeah, any, any other questions? No, in the back. No? Well, thank you, Arnie, once again. Yeah, thank it's, you. Um, <laughs>